Well, when I was a kid uh, growing up in church, I, I grew up at the, at the Bible Baptist Temple in Stonewood, West Virginia. And so the church actually started in my parents' home. My dad wasn't a pastor, but he had a friend who wanted to plant a church. And so they got together and they said, okay, that you can use our house. And so the, the church started meeting in our house and uh, it, it very quickly kind of outgrew my parents' living room. I think my, my bedroom, was, I wasn't born yet, but the bedroom that I had was like the nursery. And, and they had a piano sitting there in the living room and everybody would come and they would sing and they would worship and they would preach. And, and it, thank, the neighbors were probably pretty happy when it finally outgrew our house and they moved to a schoolhouse or somewhere else because they parked up the road everywhere. And, and the church kept growing and, and, and eventually they bought this little plot of land. It was just this big valley. It wasn't a very good piece of property, but uh, they, they were able to afford it, and they, they filled in a big hole. In West Virginia, everything's a little steeper than it is here in Pennsylvania, so you got to fill it in. There's a verse in the Bible about making the, the valleys full and the flat places or the, the mountains made smooth, and that's what you got to do down there if you want to build anything, and they built this church, and by the time I came along, it was, it was growing, and, and by the time I can remember uh, maybe five years old, six years old. I mean, there was you know, a couple hundred people coming to church every Sunday. And, and the thing that I, one of the things I remember most about growing up in church as a kid is that it, our, our church was all in on sending missionaries. Like we had, we wanted to get the gospel to people who had never heard the gospel. <clears throat> we were just all in on that. And so it was, it was very frequent that we would have missionaries come to our church and, and they would tell us about how they were in, in Africa or South America or Asia. A lot of times they were in kind of these places. And, you know, as a little child and you're you're looking at the, the, the slides, they would have these old slideshows. Does anybody, did you ever see those? Maybe in a church if, when you grew up, it had like a round thing that had a bunch of pictures in it. And it would shoot it up on the wall and they would go click, 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 and it would change. And I can remember that sound. Click, 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 click. I couldn't wait for it to click again so I could see the next thing because I mean, some of these missionaries, like they had pictures of them, like sharing the gospel with somebody that had like a bone through their nose. You know what I mean? Like, like these big, like ear things that they would do and, and or those neck things that they like. I saw all of that growing up as a kid. And my parents, a lot of times they would have the missionaries come to our house for Sunday dinner. And usually the missionary would present their, you know, their ministry on the Sunday evening service, but we'd have them over for lunch. So I got to grow up like listening to missionaries tell stories. It was a pretty cool thing. And we had this little card uh, it, it was. It would hold about the size of an index card, a little wooden block, and it was pretty thick, and it was filled with all the names of the different missionaries of our church. And we didn't have a meal at our house where somebody had to pull that card out, and then it went in the back, and we prayed for that missionary when we prayed for our meal, and then that card went in the back of the list, and then we'd pull out, you know, the next meal, we'd pull out the next one. And so even as a little kid, I kind of got to know the names of the missionaries, and my sister ended up being a missionary. But uh, here's what I remember. Every one of those slideshows, I don't know if, they, if there was like some class about being a missionary somewhere and they said, here's how your slideshow has to end because they all ended the same way. It was always a sunset picture, okay? And it might be like the savanna in Africa and you could see like a silhouette of a hut and one of those weird trees that they have that are kind of flat and the sun was setting or it'd be in the jungle or what. And it was always this sunset. And on the slide, it would say, work for the night is coming. And it was like this idea of urgency, like, yeah, it's not going to be forever. We've only got this lifetime to share the gospel. And, and someday Jesus is coming back and this whole thing's getting shut down. And, and we've only got right now to get the gospel. out. So it had that feeling of sort of that immediacy, like, man, we've got to go out. And, and a lot of people from that church went out and became missionaries and church planters because it was just it was like a central thing in our church to send people out people who probably would have really helped that church grow even more. We sent them out. They, they were good enough to be an associate pastor, maybe a lead pastor or whatever. And, and we were like, no, no, you, you got to go. You got to go. And you know what happened every time they left? Somebody else. God brought somebody else right in. It's amazing how that happened. I've heard it said that a church is not measured by its seating capacity, but by its sending capacity. And I think that that's true. That was my experience growing up. These disciples in Acts are on a mission. 
And the mission at first was to tell all the Jewish people about Jesus, that the Messiah had come. And then it went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And they even, I mean, that was a hard thing for them to go to the Samaritans. They, there was a lot of racial tension between the Jews and Samaritans, but they shared the gospel with them. And then it expanded to even the Gentiles. And that's kind of where we're at in the book of Acts, where there's this transition where the church is shifting from a Jewish center to a Gentile center. So please, Acts 13, if you've got your Bible, and, and I will just tell you, some of the slides are a little small. So there's a pew Bible in front of you. You might want to turn to Acts chapter 13 because I didn't pay attention when I was putting them on there. And some of them, unless you've got binoculars, you're not going to, that one's great. Don't think they're all going to look like this. I'm just telling you, okay? You might want to get your pew Bible out and turn it to Acts chapter 13 if you're wanting to follow along this morning. So here we go. There were in the church at Antioch. So what has happened? The center of Christianity has now moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. The center of modern Christianity is now moving south of the equator. The center of, of Christianity is no longer America in the west. It's moving south. It's moving east. There were at the church of Antioch prophets and teachers. We're going to expand upon that in, in just a moment. And it lists these five. Barnabas, who you've probably heard of, Simon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. It's a really eclectic group that they've got. Different races, different social statuses. And, and this, this church at Antioch has these, these five guys, and some of them are more of a prophetic role, and some of them are more of a teaching role. And that's how the story begins. And I want to park just for a second on this bit about the prophets and teachers. And I want us to go over to Ephesians chapter 4. And this is one of the ones that's going to be a little small and hard to read. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, And he, God, gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Why? Why did God give those gifts to the church or those giftedness to different people in the church? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Leesburg doesn't have one minister. It has hundreds or more ministers. You are the ministers. Why? For the building up of the body of Christ. What happens when the body of Christ is built up until we all attain unity of faith? Knowledge of the Son of God. He, the, the phrase here, mature manhood. You grew up. You're grown. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Like, you look like Jesus. You act like Jesus. You think like Jesus. So that we may no longer be children who are tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We are living in an age where young people are being carried away by every wind and old people are being carried away by every wind. Don't think if you've reached a certain age, Solomon, when he was old, was deceived. He was the wisest man in the world. People are being carried away by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And but if the church has apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, and the body is being built up, it's a remedy against this being carried away. Rather, speaking the truth in love, verse 15, we are able to grow up in every way into him who is, uh, is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and held together, every joint with which it is equipped. And when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So he goes to this, this human body illustration where if everything's working, it's awesome and it just grows and it functions the way that it should. H have you ever had a toothache that caused everything else to stop? Right? Or if you're, maybe you're doing some work in the yard, you're walking along and things are going great. It's happened to me before. And you step really hard and something hits your foot. You stepped on a nail. And, and this one little thing... Now you're limping around for the next couple of days where you're trying to, and, and the same thing is true in the body of Christ. When the whole body's healthy, things are going, things are growing. And, and so that analogy gets used when it's, when it's all working, it builds itself up in love. Now we use this an acronym, uh, this acronym APEST, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And 
If you are maybe in or aspiring to church leadership, you might fall into one of these categories. Okay, If you're uh, thinking, hey, I'd like to be an elder, I'd like to be a deacon. And, and by the way, those surveys are beginning to go out now for our nominating committee. There's a whole bunch over there underneath the TV. I would encourage those of you who are members to pick one up and, and let our nominating uh, committee know if you're willing to serve in, in some of those leadership roles. Um, an apostle. There are no capital A apostles today. Okay, so the apostles like the Jesus disciples and the apostle Paul, that was one generation, the early foundation of the church generation. I, I think we have what I would consider to be lowercase a apostles. They're people who take the gospel somewhere where it's never gone and establish God's kingdom in those places. Okay, that's what the first apostles did. All right, so we would call them maybe missionaries today. Prophets are those who proclaim God's word as it relates to the past, the present, and the future. Some of you are, are gifted in that you watch the news or you read the newspaper and immediately scripture comes to mind and you're able to apply God's word to today's situation or to tomorrow's situation. Evangelists, those who are uniquely gifted at communicating the gospel, they can turn anything into a gospel presentation, no matter what. I, I love it here. It's, it's coming pretty soon, kids. The children's sermons in December during Advent are called Stump the Pastor. And, and that's where you get to bring something and it's all wrapped up. I have to open it and try to teach a Bible lesson from whatever is inside the package. Now, the evangelist in the room, that's just second nature. You can put anything. You can put a styrofoam cup in there. They'd be able to share the gospel from a styrofoam cup, no matter what. Why? They're just, they're good at turning every conversation to the gospel. They're gifted as an evangelist. Shepherds are those who, uh, who tend the flock. They, they, oh, this sheep is starting to wander. Let's go talk to this person. Let's kind of bring them back into the fold. Oh, this, this sheep's getting themselves in danger. Oh, this sheep's hurt. Let's make sure we minister to that person. A lot of times those with shepherding gifts end up in a deacon role. Uh, teachers, those who explain God's word accurately, make right application of scripture. Now, here's the thing. Nobody is all of these. At best, somebody might have two or three of these and be pretty strong at two, maybe two and a half. At best. So what does the church need? It needs a plurality of leaders, which is what the Bible teaches, and that's why Presbyterians have elders. Presbyteros means elders. That's where we get the word. And so we're led by elders because not there's no pastor who has all of those. You need elders, you need deacons, you need people in leadership that have all of these. Why? Because it builds up the body so it can grow, so the saints can be equipped for the work of ministry. Now, that being said, they had prophets, they had teachers at Antioch. They listed these five that they had. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord, these folks at Antioch, at that church, and what were they doing? Worshiping the Lord and fasting. That, that also kind of has the idea that prayer was happening. The Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. So you're taking probably the best Bible teacher they've got at Antioch and probably the best shepherd they've got at Antioch in Barnabas because we know he was a great encourager. And the Holy Spirit says, I need these guys for a job. Set them aside. This is asking a lot of a church that's in an explosive growth situation. They need Paul. They need Barnabas. And the Holy Spirit says, no, I need Paul and I need Barnabas. Set them aside. They're proven. They're tested. They're theologically sound. A, a while back, and I don't know when exactly it happened, I want to say probably in the uh, World War II and, and a little bit after that, in America and in the Western church in general, we kind of had this idea, let's get young people send them to maybe a Bible college or a seminary, and then let's send them to Africa and send them to Asia and send them, and, and, and they'll be great missionaries uh, because they're young, they can withstand the disease and all the stuff maybe that you have to go through. And so church planting and mission work almost entirely went to younger people for almost a whole generation. And in many ways, it didn't work. People would go and then they'd, they'd bail. They, they'd go for a short time. Why? They weren't tested. They hadn't been tried in ministry and tried through the fires. And so whenever things got difficult, they bailed. Now, some certainly did. Some certainly made it. Absolutely. And, and, and Paul mentored Timothy and said, Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youth, but be an example. So, so many did. But this is an interesting uh, 
thing that the church at Antioch did is they sent, it was almost like they're sending two, like if they had five pastors on staff, they're sending two of their five to go be missionaries. What happens when you do that? After fasting, verse 3, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They prayed. I bet they were praying, Lord, you better better bring somebody in. Because can you imagine being the guy who had to teach the Sunday school class for Paul after Paul left? Yeah. Who wants to? That's a lot. Gene, would you want to teach the Sunday school class the week after Paul left? Hey, Gene, uh, we got a job for you. Paul's leaving. No. I mean, he's the, probably the best Bible teacher they've got. Can you imagine trying to step into Barnabas's role as this great shepherd and encourager and, and thinking, I can't do it. And probably, probably the, the, whoever filled in for Barnabas and whoever filled in for Paul, you know what, in week one and week two, it was probably pretty shaky. People probably were nice at the church door and were like, okay, good job, you know. But it probably wasn't. But you know what happened? That person grew. There was a vacancy, and that person now grew into a position. And, and they didn't create a glass ceiling in the church that nobody could ever grow up into a leadership position. Because instead of taking people who don't have experience and sending them out, they were taking the people that had the experience and sending them on mission, and it gave a chance for people to come up through. And Antioch grew, and Antioch flourished even after Paul and Barnabas left. Verse 4, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to uh, Seleucia, from there, they sailed to Cyprus. And don't worry, we're not doing the entirety of Acts 13 today. It's like 50 verses. All right. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down from Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of the Lord in the Jewish synagogue. And this was pretty much Paul's, like, that's kind of what he did first. He would usually go to a Jewish synagogue when he went to a new town because he knew that those people were grounded in the Old Testament scriptures. And if they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they would be good people to disciple other people because he wasn't staying forever. He was leaving after that. And so he needed to make sure he was leaving people behind who were grounded in God's word and could teach sound doctrine. So he would typically go to the synagogues first and then after that minister to uh, the Gentiles. They had John to assist them. This is John Mark who writes the gospel of Mark later. He was mentioned last chapter. When they had gone through the whole island, verse 6, as far as Paphos, they came to a certain magician. This is a, a, probably an exorcist, a guy who was kind of uh, into the occult and all of that kind of stuff. He was a Jewish false prophet, and his name was Bar-Jesus. Jesus was a common name back then. Uh, so his name is Bar-Jesus, and he is a false prophet who's a Jew. He was with the proconsul, so sort of a mayor or governor, Sergius Paulus a man of intelligence, well-educated, wondering about this message that he's been hearing about Christianity. And he summoned Paul, uh, Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, and that's the other name for Bar-Jesus, uh, that's probably his Greek name because uh, it means magician. Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. I can't tell you the number of times that I've sat in a living room or sitting on a front porch or talking with somebody who's an unbeliever, sharing the gospel with an unbeliever, and you get to the point about Jesus dying on the cross for their sin, and what are you going to do when all of a sudden, like, uh, you know, a motorcycle gang drives by, you know, or, or, or the, some kid runs in and turns the TV up really loud in the living room, like, it's, 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 I expect it. I expect that if I'm sharing the gospel with somebody, some enormous distraction is going to happen. You know, why? Because we're in a war. We are in a spiritual war and Satan doesn't want to give people up. They're in his kingdom and he wants to keep them. And so he'll always send some elements in some form or another to try to distract and dissuade people from the gospel. Look at how Elymas was seeking to turn this man away. Uh, verse 9, Saul, who was also called Paul, and I think from now on he gets called Paul. It'll be so much easier. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil. I, I, I want to start making like, I have a laser engraver and a bunch of wood. I want to start making plaques of Bible verses that nobody else makes. This would be an awesome plaque. Wouldn't you like to have this in your office? You son of the devil. 
you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy. Villainy, what a great word. Full of deceit and all villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight path? What's he doing? He's complicating the simple. He's making something that the gospel is understandable by children. A child can understand that they're a sinner, that Jesus died in their place for their sin. And if they call upon Christ and ask him for forgiveness of sin and, and seek salvation, that Jesus gives it freely. Like a child can understand it. But what happens? Well, we can complicate it. We can, add, we can sprinkle some good works in there, maybe a church membership in there. Well, And Elmas is complicating. He's making crooked something that was straight. So Paul, is when he says, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths? Paul, since this is a Jewish, remember, he's a Jewish magician. Paul is quoting the Old Testament, basically. Adam, look at these passages in Isaiah. Uh, they were on the bottom of that previous slide. Um, the way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Micah 3, nine. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight. The gospel, Jesus came and he preached to farmers and fishermen and simple folks, and the gospel is simple. In fact, the simplicity of the gospel can end up being a stumbling block to those who want to complicate it and make it more, uh, they're, they're, they've educated. The Bible says professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Verse 11, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. This is Paul speaking to Elymas. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. When was the last time in the book of Acts that somebody was struck with this blindness? It was Paul himself, Saul on the Damascus road when he was going to go persecute the church and a voice came from heaven and said, why are you persecuting me? And, and, and he was blinded for a time and then he was brought back. And so I think that this is like Paul is hoping that this man will turn. And he's pronouncing on him the same sentence that had brought repentance in his own life. And darkness falls upon this guy and he walks out. Now, then it says in verse 12, and we'll close with verse 12, the proconsul believed when he saw all that occurred, for he was astonished. Not so much at the miracle, he saw that, but what was he astonished at? The teaching, the word of God just it hit him. It's kind of like when they, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, when Jesus spoke, they said, ah, oh, this, this guy's got authority. There's something about this. The truth was hitting this man hard, and he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What's our takeaway this morning as we wrap it up? What are you willing to lose in order that you might gain? For the church at Antioch, they had to lose a great Bible teacher in Paul and a great shepherd in Barnabas, but they were willing to give that up for God's kingdom. And I think sometimes as a church, we have to make collective sacrifices, but sometimes as individuals, we have to make sacrifices. Uh, the, the missionaries to the Indians in, uh, in South America that were killed uh, trying to establish a church, uh, Jim Elliott, I believe in his journal says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus' words are this, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul. What would you be willing to lose? What if God is calling you to do something? Something big, something crazy, something that, that you'd be afraid to even tell your, 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 your family about. It. I, I kind of grew up in a family where, man, my sister went to Africa as a missionary. She's like, okay, we're going to Africa because that's what God wants us to do. And, and, I, and I grew up in a church where people were, were prompted regularly to think about that. Like, this life is short. It, it, what we accomplish for Christ is what matters. The only thing you take to heaven with you are people. And, and, and the sun is setting and the time is growing short. You have a chance to, to maybe do something big for God, like something that, I mean, and the small things matter and the big things matter, but think about it. Is God putting in your heart something bigger, something riskier? For Barnabas and Saul, it was going on a journey. For a church, it was losing them. Are you being called to mission, to church planting? 
Many times God calls those who are seasoned, those who have been proven in the fires. Sometimes nowadays it can be an opportunity through employment. There's many missionaries right now that are missionaries by employment because so many companies are international that they can go to another country and be a missionary and no church even has to support them. They, they, you know, whatever the corporation is paying them to be there and they start Bible studies and they start churches in places where missionaries can't even go. Are you being called to mission or to church planting? And last, let us not make crooked what is straight. Let us not make complex what is simple. The gospel, be able to articulate the gospel in a few sentences, be able to share the gospel in a few sentences. It may take some later explanation, but be able to share it quickly. Paul put it as briefly as this in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. The gospel in a nutshell. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, I pray that You would help us learn from the lives of these people from a couple thousand years ago. They served You, they loved You, and You used them in mighty ways. And we today are the beneficiaries of their sacrifice and their service to You. And Lord, who might be the beneficiaries of our sacrifice and our service to You in years to come. Lord, I pray that you would call from this congregation those who would serve you in mission and church planting. Begin to put it in their heart even now if you haven't already. Lord, I pray that you would move among us. Make us a sending church, we ask. Lord, I pray that as we lift you up, you would draw people to yourself. Lord, let it begin at home. Let it begin across the fence, at the workplace, with our friends and our relatives. Let us be zealous for evangelism. In Jesus' name, amen.